Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is part three of the D-Bit Grinder restoration. We're going to have to make another tool, and that torch is going to make an appearance. So let's go. So if you're just joining us on this series, this is the Coolman SU2 cutter grinder that we're restoring, and I'm working on the what I've been calling the middly bottom bit, which attaches to the middly bit there. And uh, this is all part of the uh, larger assembly that forms the workhead. So we're going to start with the uh, middly bottom bit here and uh, we're going to disassemble this guy and uh, let's see I guess we'll start with these screws here now these screws aren't uh, retaining anything they're actually just stops it's part of how the uh, piece that attaches to this works I just love these uh, machined stopper screws they're absolutely beautifully made and they're in perfect condition and of course there's multiple sizes because of course there are so we'll need to pay attention to that on reassembly Luckily, this is all being videotaped because I have a YouTube channel. Yeah, let's see what else can I take apart. Okay, there's something here that looked like a dirt spot, but actually, uh, on further inspection, it is a set screw. So I can dig the crud out of that guy. And uh, yeah, just to confirm, there is a hexagonal profile in there. So it's not very big, but it is in fact a set screw of some sort. So we'll take that guy out. And it looks like, yeah, that was retaining this handle. And, uh, oh, that's a really interesting part. So this is all the uh, locking mechanism for the uh, main shaft that runs down through this part of the workhead. And that's actually two parts. Here's a close look at that plunger that acts as the lock on that shaft. And I don't know why, this part just tickles me. I think it's really beautifully made. And the shaft on this handle is cool too. There's the toothed wheel on one end, and then there's both an interior and an exterior thread on this guy. So that's a quite a cool part as well. And we can take this other locking handle off. And it all looks good. So next I'll try and take out this cone-shaped spring. And uh, a viewer on the previous video let me know that this is called a diaphragm spring, which is a cool name. And I, had to, I assumed it was in some sort of channel in there, and so I was going to have to pull it inward. But uh, that didn't seem to work, so not sure how to get that out. But maybe we'll come back to that. So instead we're going to try to take this uh, main shaft out that goes down through the center and there's a roll pin in there that's holding that guy in place. So we're going to have to tap that out. So I set it up in the soft jaws on the vise here just to kind of hold it in place and I got my skinniest punch in there and uh, the roll pin was tapping out pretty easily but yeah then at this point I realized there's a flaw in this plan there's not enough room around that diaphragm spring. So that does in fact have to come out first. And yeah, sure enough, it just lifts right out. And in fact, it's actually three pieces. So that's pretty interesting. Those are cool parts. And so now we have the access that we need to get back in here and tap our friend the roll pin all the way out. And there we go. And that main shaft now comes out. The main shaft through the whole assembly is pretty cool too. As you can see, there's a center there where they uh, turned that on the lathe. And in fact, you can still see the uh, tool marks on the uh, upper end there. That would actually be a great beginner lathe project. All right, looks like we're down to the casting. There's nothing else to remove. This is quite a sophisticated casting, actually. It's a very nice part. So now we can start dismantling these locking handles. And uh, these guys are all spring-loaded and they're keyed so you can change the orientation of the handle uh, as you need to as you're tightening them and loosening them. And uh, I would expect this screw to come out and it does, so that's good. And there's a little spring in there that puts the tension on that handle. And then those two parts pull apart. And you can see the toothed wheel there that keys the handle onto the shaft. The second locking handle is similar in construction, so I figured oh, I can just remove this screw. And, uh, well, it did dislodge the spring, which was seized, so that's moving now, but uh, the screw didn't turn. A little more muscle. Nope. So next we'll try a trick that works for me uh, in a lot of cases like this. It's a screwdriver bit on a ratchet handle. And what that does is it gives you a lot of leverage for the turning. And so you can use your muscle to keep the screwdriver planted down in the screw and prevent stripping it. Not have to split your muscle effort between trying to get, or get torque on a small screwdriver handle while also holding it in. But even with all that leverage, that thing would not budge. It was in there. 
So the next thing I tried is tapping on the screwdriver with a hammer and not too hard, you know, you don't want to hammer on a screwdriver, but oftentimes just getting a little bit of vibration down into that system will knock something loose, but uh, nope, still no good. Now, as anyone who's torn down rusty old cars knows, one thing that pretty much always works is heat. You get that thing nice and hot, let it cool off, and that expansion and contraction action will break it loose. And there she goes. I don't think I've ever found a fastener that can withstand heat. Now, it looks good. Spring and the bolt are all intact. It was just really thoroughly seized in there. That thing was pretty well pre-chowdered before I even got here, so I'm not the first person to have trouble getting that guy out. You can see the crud in there that was welding it into that uh, part. All right, since there is some rust on a bunch of these parts, we're gonna put them all in this bin here and load it up with evapo rust. And sidebar, you'll note that some of the parts I put in there, for example, the locking handles, are actually aluminum, so they don't have any rust on them. So the evapo rust isn't doing any good. However, you'll note that on a modern equivalent of this type of machine, those locking handles would definitely be plastic. And so putting those in the evapo rust would also have no effect. I thought I was pretty clever. I chose this bin that was uh, deep enough for all of the parts. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know what I didn't realize? That, oh, there's uh, green handles in that bin. And you know what those green handles sit in? They sit in holes. Yeah. So right around here is where I realized the terrible, terrible mistake I had just made. And yeah, now you'll hear me rummaging around in the shop in a panic, looking for something to put this fluid in. And watch that evapo rust slide off the bottom of the screen and off the end of my workbench. More panic, more panic. Looking for a container, digging through all my bins. Let's see, panic, panic, panic. Evapo rust everywhere. And nope, still panicking. You know, I don't remember the panic being quite this long. Here we go. Okay, found another bin and some paper towels and we're gonna clean everything up. And uh, yeah, so then I went ahead and got a, a different container for the part that was taller than the area uh, where the holes are that those green plastic candles mount in. So I let those sit in there, honestly, just a few hours. The container says uh, you can do 12 hours or even more, but uh, uh, this stuff wasn't that rusty. So it uh, only needed a couple of hours and uh, it came out looking really quite good. You can see how nicely everything cleaned up. So then everything uh, got a rinse and a dry and a light coating of oil. And now we are ready to reassemble. So I started with the diaphragm springs. And some of you may be screaming at your YouTube players right now because you may recall that uh, this was the incorrect order of operations. But uh, yeah, well, past me doesn't know that yet. So past me is enjoying how satisfying it is to press that spring back into that recess. And next we'll reassemble these locking handles. So get some oil going in there and some oil on that shaft. And that goes back in there. And then the cone spring and the bolt go back in there. And note that these uh, springs do have a small end and a big end. So the small end has to go against the bolt. And that guy is looking really good. And yeah, that moves very, very smoothly now, which is a big improvement to uh, the, the way it was when I took it apart. And then the other handle assembles the same way. Okay, over to this main bearing surface now. Nice light coating of oil on that. You can see how the evapo rust cleaned that up really nicely. And here's an old mechanics trick for getting a, th a bolt started without cross-threading it. You turn it to the left for a ways and you'll, until you feel it drop into that first thread and then turn it to the right and away it will go. That works really well uh, when you're working on blind bolts like upside down under a car or something like that. And you can see that these two stopper bolts are different sizes and something doesn't feel right there because that large bolt is touching the wear area on the outside, which makes me think it's not supposed to be there. So I actually went back and checked my video and uh, yeah, sure enough, those are, uh, that's the correct order for those guys to go in. And you remember this piece that I loved and uh, it cleaned up super, super nicely. So we can reinstall that in our handle. And you can see here how this little uh, dog point set screw restrains the uh, motion of that guy. It's a pretty cool little mechanism. So we can put that set screw in part way and then we can thread this guy in. And this is a little tricky. We have to get it so the wedge on the end of that plunger is lined up with the shaft. And so you can see inside of that hole, you can see how this mechanism works once that's all lined up. 
So now I'm going to reinstall that main shaft and I'm going to need a roll pin for that. I don't like to reuse old roll pins, so over to the toy box here for a brand new one of the correct size. And we'll put some oil on that shaft. And right here is where I remembered that, oh yeah, the roll pin has to go in before the diaphragm spring, so out comes the spring. And uh, I fiddled around a lot trying to uh, get access to pound this guy in. It's uh, it's very tricky, uh, but what seemed to work was uh, a combination of a V-block and a bench block to support the bolt, and a piece of scrap to support the casting, and then I could tap it in. And back in goes the diaphragm spring and another little coating of oil and everything just for good measure. All right, next we're going to move on to the uh, the middle bit of the workhead, and I'm going to just kind of speed through this because it's mostly very similar parts to what you just saw me do on the uh, lower middly bit. Uh, but I'm going to stop right here because this is a really cool part, this uh, locking mechanism for that rotating ring. So uh, let's take a little bit closer look at how that works. This is the locking handle, and you can see there's actually an eccentric on there. So that slides in there. So as you rotate the handle, the eccentric moves that, uh, that uh, bolt head up and down, and that bolt head is what captures the ring and locks it down. So yeah, that's a really cool thing. And uh, we'll take another close look at that when we reassemble it, because reassembling this guy turns out to be pretty tricky. So back to disassembly. And for cleaning, I'm using a mix of uh, one to one diluted simple green. And for any kind of mystery goo areas, I'm using WD 40. WD 40 is a good general solvent for mystery goo. And uh, so it gets that guy all cleaned up nice. And now uh, you can see that the uh, dovetails are in very nice shape. You can see the original scraping is still visible. And uh, the base of the dovetail there, you can see the uh, tool marks from how that was machined. So this guy uh, doesn't seem to need any work. That's good news. Now this is a really cool piece. It looks like all one part, but uh, looking at the uh, parts diagram that I have from the French uh, version of the manual, which one of my viewers managed to find, uh, you can see that it's uh, marked as a separate part. So it must be pressed in there. It doesn't appear to be threaded. So there's certainly no way to press it out. So uh, it's gonna stay there. And now all the parts on this second mechanism go into the evapo rust, And a couple hours later, they come out looking very, very nice. That part looks like brand new. And once again, everything gets a rinse and a light oiling. I think putting all these parts in the evapo rust may have been a little bit of a miscalculation. In hindsight, I think some of these parts had a black oxide finish on them. And a proper industrial hot blackening is a layer of magnetite on the part. And magnetite is very chemically similar to rust. It's just an extra iron and an extra oxygen atom. So it seems that evapo rust takes that off as well. I didn't really think about that because evapo rust says it's safe on all finishes and all materials, but yeah. Maybe not so much. So I could cold blue these to get them back to the uh, original look. Ironically, cold bluing probably does stand up to evapor rust because it's not uh, an oxide finish. It's a copper selenium deposition. So uh, the evapor rust may not react with that. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna keep them oiled and uh, leave them rust steel for now and uh, we'll see how it goes. Here's that cam lock mechanism again that I loved. It came out beautifully. And uh, boy, that part is well made. It's, it looks like it's been surface ground. Oh man, the Germans. Now, uh, it's actually two parts. You can see there's a roll pin there, but it's a very tiny roll pin, like a 16th or smaller maybe, and I actually don't have a punch small enough to take that out, so I just left it in place. But reinstalling that cam mechanism actually turns out to be pretty tricky, as you'll see here. So it, uh, it wasn't enough to just put that guy back in place and line it up and push the shaft back in. Yeah, this uh, I fiddled with this for quite a while. So it turns out what has to happen is you have to take apart this adjustment and uh, there's a jam nut on there that I couldn't loosen. So I tried my tapping the screwdriver trick again to get some shock waves going through there. And that did the trick. So I got that jam nut off of there. And yeah, after a lot of fiddling around, I determined that what you have to do is uh, set an adjustment on this guy, set it in place, and then look down through the hole in the end and see if it's lined up. And if it's not, then adjust it a little more up or down and then keep reinstalling it and, and uh, testing it until it's lined up. And then you can lock the jam nut down and then you can put it back in there and then the shaft will slide into place. It's a lot of trial and error because you can't access the jam nut with the whole assembly in place. There's an order of operations problem there. But once that's all in place, you can put that set screw back in there which holds it all together. And I want to demo this mechanism for you because it's really cool. So you turn it one way and the ring is locked and you turn it the other way and the ring unlocks. And uh, if you look very closely at that 
screw head, it's moving up and down ever so slightly as I turn this handle. It's very subtle, but that's how that lock works. Really cool. Okay, so now we can reassemble the other locking handle. Pretty standard stuff, and we can reinstall the Gibbs and all that. And nice uh, coating of oil on everything once again. And we're about ready now to reinstall the uh, two assemblies together, so that's pretty exciting. That all goes together nice, and then those uh, spanner nuts need to go back on now. And they set the tension and the end play on this rotating assembly. Oh, but guess what? we don't have the right tool to tighten these guys down. You remember last time I cheated and I used uh, vice grips along with a uh, custom socket that I made. Well, that's not gonna be good enough this time. So we're gonna actually grab some bar stock here and make a proper spanner wrench for tightening that guy down. So I uh, got some layout die on there and what I'm doing is just tracing one of these spanner nuts so that I can get the right profile for my spanner wrench. So you can see there, that's what I need to cut out. Now, the fun fact is, my mill is still down, so it would be really nice to just mill this out on the milling machine, but I can't. So we're going to do this with uh, a little more old school method. So I start by cutting out the rough shape on the bandsaw for the uh, overall wrench. And then I just kind of chop the corners off because I want it to have mostly a, uh, a round shape to it. This will save us a bunch of time later. Now the tricky part is the interior profile of the spanner. So uh, I start by cutting two slots uh, on either side of the area that we need to remove. And uh, then I'm going to go over to the drill press here and I'm going to drill out most of this material. So I started with a, a quarter inch pilot and then I come back in with a half inch drill which is uh, just a little bit smaller than the uh, final opening here that we need. And with that guy drilled out, you can see how we've uh, almost connected those two slots there. And so we just have a little bit more work to do over on the bench with the files. So uh, I bring the apprentice in here and get to work with a series of files. And I start by using the round file to just uh, uh, open, open it up down to those slots that we made with the bandsaw. And uh, that removes basically like 95% of the material that uh, is in our way. And so now we just need to form this little tooth over here that actually engages with the nut. And uh, so yeah, a whole lot more filing and uh, I cheated a little bit and used the Dremel in a few places, but now we have a cool spanner wrench that will get that job done. And sorry to the British viewers, I know that spanner wrench is redundant, but eh, look at it this way. At least by making this guy, we didn't have to go to the ATM machine and get some money to buy one. Okay, so now we can go back to the assembly and use our newly made spanner. Eh, you're welcome. Use the newly made spanner and that custom made socket that I made before to set the uh, proper tension on this guy. So we're looking for a uh, smooth rotation with no end play. So there shouldn't be any up or down motion and everything should spin freely. And after a couple of iterations of that, it is moving perfectly, no end play. Very happy with that. And that is gonna do it for the bottom half of the work head. It's pretty much fully restored now. I'm very happy with that. So uh, that's going to do it for this time. Please do consider supporting me on Patreon. You know, the patrons are really the only thing keeping this channel going. Without you fine folks, I couldn't do this. So thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.